Way back in the 18th century, people figured out we could burn coal to power new industrial technologies like steamships and factories. And coal meant people and businesses could get a lot more done. So they went all in. Around a century later, people in the US discovered petroleum deposits deep beneath the ground, and oil became the hot new fossil fuel for industry and agriculture. Then we moved on to natural gas, or methane, to produce electricity and heat our homes. Now, from plastic takeout containers to electricity to fertilizers, it's hard to go a day without using something that's made from or powered by fossil fuels. Here's the problem. Burning fossil fuels is cranking up Earth's thermostat. You know this, I know this, people around the world have known this for decades. And with all of the headlines and debates and articles and videos out there, it can be easy to tune it out and feel like we've heard it all before. But we need to keep paying attention. To this video, of course, but also to the science of climate change, so we know exactly what's going on, what to do about it, and whether it all just comes down to cows. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. So here's what's going on. Every time we burn coal, oil, or gas, greenhouse gases are emitted into the atmosphere. Today, about 76% of the greenhouse gases we emit are carbon dioxide, almost exclusively thanks to burning fossil fuels. But there are also other greenhouse gases causing big problems, like nitrous oxide from fertilizing crops, and methane that comes from garbage dumps, natural gas leaks, and cow burps. Really, cows and other livestock come with a lot of emissions. In the atmosphere, these gases work like the walls of a greenhouse. So they let sunlight pass through to warm the Earth's surface. Earth then radiates that heat back into the atmosphere, but at longer wavelengths. And and energy at those wavelengths can be absorbed by greenhouse gases and re-radiated back down to the Earth's surface or into another greenhouse gas molecule. And that's a good thing. It's why we can live on this planet and why we don't live on Mars. See, the greenhouse effect happens naturally, and one of the most important greenhouse gases is water vapor. Like other greenhouse gases, water vapor holds on to heat, and the warmer the air, the more moisture it can hold on to. And the more moisture in the air, the more heat it can hold on to. And so on. And carbon dioxide is emitted when living things breathe, die, or decompose. But plants and ocean creatures like phytoplankton also absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Plus, carbon dioxide dissolves into seawater. In fact, the ocean absorbs so much more carbon dioxide than it emits that we call it a carbon sink. I mean, with how big the ocean is, I'd call it a carbon bathtub, but no one ever lets me name these things. Jokes aside, the trouble with greenhouse gases is that we've put way too many of them into the atmosphere, while also clearing big areas of forests and grasslands that would normally absorb carbon dioxide. Our natural carbon sinks, bathtubs, and swimming pools can't keep up anymore. Today, there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there has been in the last two million years. That's the problem we normally hear about. But methane and nitrous oxide are even more potent. Methane doesn't last as long in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, but it can trap nearly 30 times as much heat. That cow gas is powerful stuff. And nitrous oxide can trap a whopping 265 times as much. Plus, with more of these gases and higher temperatures, there's also more water vapor in the air, which means it can get even warmer. So together, they're all heating things up more and more with every flip of the calendar. See this graph? This long side is Earth's average global temperature before the Industrial Revolution. During this time, Earth's climate was really stable, so humans were able to do stuff like settle in one place, develop complex agricultural systems with lots of cows, and focus on developing technology. But then there's this little line that looks like the business end of a hockey stick. That tracks Earth's average global temperature since 1850. Once industrialization kicked off, the graph goes from stable to shooting straight up in the air, with no signs of coming down. It's why you keep seeing headlines about how it's the new hottest year on record. In a bad way. In 2023, Earth's average temperature was 1.18 degrees Celsius hotter than it was in 1850. That doesn't sound like a big deal if you think of it in terms of everyday weather. Like, if the temperature in New York was 1.2 degrees warmer today, I don't know that I'd really notice. But this number is a global average, and that means some areas of the Earth have been heating up even faster. For instance, the Antarctic has experienced heat waves with temperatures 40 degrees Celsius above average. And even the penguins who prefer to use Fahrenheit? No, that's a lot. As the climate warms, we get closer to the tipping points we talked about in our Mean Girls episode. There's a connection, I promise. That's things like glacier melt, thawing permafrost, and rainforest dieback. Over time, climate change pushes Earth's environment into a new state that's different from the one we're used to living in. And since our human and environmental systems aren't ready for those conditions, climate change spells trouble. To give just one example, rising temperatures means melting ice, and adding a bunch of fresh water to the oceans slows down their circulation. This leads to drier weather, including more frequent droughts in the Amazon. And as my houseplants will tell you, droughts inhibit healthy plant growth, so the Amazon's capacity for storing carbon shrinks, which means more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which 
leads to more global warming. In the short term, communities such as the Yanomami, who depend on the Amazon rainforest, will struggle to run their economies and maintain their livelihoods. But losing the Amazon also means losing a key contributor to other ecosystems and societies. And without it, the whole Earth will warm faster. And like I said, governments, companies, scientists, and probably even the cows have known about this for decades. So far, knowing about it hasn't stopped it, which can be super infuriating. But it's also not like we haven't done anything about it. Countries around the world have made efforts at climate mitigation, or slowing the effects of climate change. In 1992, leaders from 178 countries came together at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro to sign an international treaty to stop climate change. This treaty was called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC. And in 1997, countries who signed this treaty adopted the Kyoto Protocol, which set legally binding limits on greenhouse gas emissions. Great, except it didn't work, because kind of like when you make a goal to crochet 24 dog sweaters, in order to make that happen, you need to follow through. I'm making progress, really. And some countries didn't do that. Like, the US didn't officially ratify the protocol because the US Senate didn't want to. Classic. Which meant they weren't legally bound to follow its parameters. Canada signed on and ratified it, but then they withdrew in 2012 because it was going to be too expensive. Know what else is expensive? Moving to Mars because we made Earth uninhabitable. So world leaders called a redo. In 2015, they met in Paris to draft a new climate agreement to set greenhouse gas targets that would ideally limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. This was called the Paris Agreement. And its key feature was that it created nationally determined contributions. These are also called NDCs, because governments love a good acronym, and they allowed individual countries to set their own climate mitigation strategies based on what made sense for them. For example, one of Chile's NDCs focuses on protecting the ocean, which makes sense given their impressive coastline. Morocco, on the other hand, set an NDC to reduce emissions during phosphate manufacturing, which matters because they hold 75% of Earth's phosphate reserves. Allowing this kind of flexibility got a lot of countries to sign the Paris Agreement—196 of them, in fact. Again, that's great, but it's also still not enough. About every six years, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, releases a report that provides critical scientific information on the state of climate change today. That information can also help countries make plans for climate adaptation. In fact, the Paris Agreement requires countries to update their NDCs every five years. According to the 2021 report, the current NDCs from the Paris Agreement aren't enough to keep us under our 1.5 degree target. So governments are working together to set new goals to try and make a bigger impact. Some say we need to do a lot more about the cows. But it's really hard to actually address climate change. Lots of people have been working on it for decades, and yet the world's average temperature is already more than one degree Celsius higher than it was before the Industrial Revolution. So there's always more we can do. That adaptation can happen on the community and individual level as well. For example, we know climate change will make some dry places even more dry, which increases drought and wildfire risks in vulnerable areas. So people can do things like clear flammable brush from around homes and buildings to protect community members. Meanwhile, in coastal areas facing sea level rise, people can plant mangrove forests to prevent flooding and storms. And don't worry, people are working on making cows less gassy. Ultimately, addressing climate change is up to all of us, and we can't just blame the cows. We all share an atmosphere, so whether we're in Boston or Beijing, we're impacting the environment for everyone for centuries to come. It can feel really frustrating to keep having to learn about climate change, and it can feel really hopeless to keep hearing about all the ways we failed to fix it. But that doesn't mean we should give up. Every step we take in the right direction, every fraction of a degree of warming we avoid, reduces the amount of suffering communities around the world will experience. And our climate change efforts haven't been a complete failure. Way back in the 1980s, when everyone had big hair and an affinity for step aerobics, scientists showed that our use of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, in things like refrigerants and pesticides was ripping a hole in the ozone layer. And then 197 countries agreed to ban the use of CFCs. Now the ozone layer is on its way to being healed. And 30 years later, that same international treaty that banned CFCs also banned hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, another potent greenhouse gas. This ban will help us avoid half a degree Celsius of warming going forward. It can feel really scary and hopeless, but we've made incredible climate gains before. So we have to believe we can do it again. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment if you remember the hole in the ozone layer, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.